At Parker, our purpose is simple. We want to make the world a better place. By working more efficiently. By using more sustainable practices. By developing better technologies. We keep moving forward. With each new idea, innovation, and partnership, we're one step closer to fulfilling our purpose every single day. To find out more, visit parker.com slash purpose. Parker, engineering your success. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows granger has got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Let's <laughs> wait. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Uh, welcome to Herd Tell. Okay, let's go back overseas, talk a little bit of some really interesting stuff going on in the UK that, yes, it's a little different, but there's some universal principles to apply there. We've got Jack Rowlett back with us, Young Voices contributor. He's a writer and commentator coming to us from Nottingham, England, of Robin Hood fame. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. It's good to be here. Looking so forward to discussing it's... Britain. Yeah, I am too. So we, we you got a mess with the NHS National Health System going over there right now. Everything from ambulance response times, you got nurses strikes, now you've got a doctor shortage. This looks like a real big hot mess on the outside, but the real problem with this is the more you look at it, it doesn't look like there's a lot of solutions coming anytime soon on some of these issues. Yeah, I mean it's it's top of the political agenda here at the moment. And something something that's interesting is in this country we sort of look down our noses at America. And you guys is having you don't have universal health care and you know your health care outcomes are determined often by whether you've got a job how much money you have and we sort of get this we have this real sense of superiority in britain that we have this free at the point of use health care and everybody has access to it but actually now increasingly because of the state of the healthcare system i don't think we can really claim to be a country with universal health care anymore you know, I've, I've been in um, accident and emergency in Nottingham recently, and you've got people on beds in corridors, you've got people sleeping on the floors, you've got, you know, wait times of days now, in some cases, for accident and emergency care. Uh, and we've got, you know, we've got, uh, I think it's about 500 people a week currently dying purely because of the extended wait times for accessing care. And it, in terms of the solutions, I think we've we've got, there are a couple of problems here one of which is that it sort of has to get worse before it gets better and so i think that's the that's the dynamic of us feeling like it we can't really make it better like there's no solutions to the problem because actually there's nothing that's going to make it better tomorrow but there are a number of things that we can do reasonably quickly so one thing that's being talked about a lot over here is that two that we could um allow pharmacies to prescribe medication because they're not allowed to do that so for kind of less serious illnesses you would be able to go to your pharmacy rather than your doctor and get a prescription for some medication from them and that's sort of we've got a big problem with um wait times for doctor's appointments as well so that would help out with that as well um and then other solutions like the fact that the, the nhs model really focuses on acute care and it doesn't focus enough on making sure people are fit and healthy in general and so preventative care and so there's a, a lot of talk about how we need to we really need to transition to focusing on that sort of care as well, um, because then you avoid this sort of crisis happening in the first place if you have a fitter, healthier population. Yeah. Jack Rowlett joining us. Let's let's have the grown folk talk about this, though, is because too much when you're talking policy wise, like when we're talking on a show like this or we're writing a piece, some of our friends use universal health care or government health care, single payer, whatever terminology you want to use. Almost like it's a magic word, like, oh, we'll just have universal health care and it fixes everything. Whatever system you're advocating for, if it's not well administered, it really doesn't matter because you're still going to have problems with it. And that's where we this thing kind of falls apart is like, look, it's it's not a magical incantation. If you're going to have universal health care, there are trade offs to it. You're going to pay much higher taxes. You're going to have limited options on your health care. You're going to have those trade offs, but it is free and everybody gets it. 
We just don't want to have those full discussions past the buzzwords sometimes. Like you just said, you've said it for so long. Well, we have universal health care. You don't. This is the risk of it in inertia. If you don't administer it, it really doesn't matter, does it? Yeah, I mean, if it's free but terrible, then there's not much point in having it at all. Um, and, and ultimately, somebody does have to pay. And that's uh, that's the sort of difference is, is ultimately care in America is rationed just as it is here. It's just here it's being rationed at random in a healthcare system that's sort of crumbling all around us, whereas in America it's more rationed on the base of your income or your job, right? Um, and and here there is a real, we, call, we often say in the UK that the NHS is the closest thing we have to a national religion. Like that's the sort of cult-like status it has in the national psyche. And for a long time, any talk of reforming it at all immediately leads to suggestions that you want to replace it with an American style system and that you want to privatize it and you're going to sell off the NHS to private American pharmaceutical and, and medical companies. And so there are all these roadblocks to reform. And and it's a lot of it is driven by the politicians, because as soon as you have one party say, OK, well, the NHS is a mess. We need to reform it. Let's do A, B and C. The other parties come along and say, ah, no, you want to privatize the NHS. They're going to destroy it. That if you want to save the NHS, you've got to vote for us at the next election. And so nothing ever changes. But I think right now, the scale of it is is just unimaginable. I don't think people really imagine that we'd reach a point in this country where you are ringing 999 for an ambulance and potentially it just doesn't come and you, you end up dying in your home or your loved one ends up dying. And so I think now there is there is something of a changing attitude and people are acknowledging that maybe we do need a change to our healthcare system. And that maybe even, I, I think uh, our attachment to universal healthcare is resolute, but that maybe this model of universal healthcare just doesn't work with the aging population we have. Jack Rowlett joining us. See, this is the problem in healthcare in America is the older you get, the more expensive you get. We're talking about the business side of it now. The older you get, the more expensive you get. And we have an insurance heavy model for good, bad, or indifferent. So, you know, the young people have to pay into it, although they're not using as many services, broadly speaking, to take care of the older people. That's the problem. You already mentioned it. For folks that aren't familiar with the national health system, it was built, it's a post-World War II thing heavily. That's kind of the model. It was designed for that Britain, because that was the Britain that existed then, the UK more broadly. That's not the UK that exists now. There is the talk that it didn't keep up to the times as it was supposed to, that focused on acute care, not focused on things like preventative care or long-term care or even palliative care for the elderly. That's where you start getting into the nuts and bolts medical policy problems here. And that's where a lot of the debate is, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's actually it's been flawed since the start. Because, yeah, you mentioned it's a, it's a post-war model of healthcare. It's absolutely right. It was started in the late 1940s. But actually, the expectation of the government that brought it in was you would cut healthcare spending in the medium and long run as a result of bringing in universal healthcare because you'd treat people and so their conditions wouldn't get worse. But actually, what happened was the sheer scale of demand meant that actually healthcare spending has just risen inexorably since then. And we've reached a tipping point now because of those sort of demographic issues we've got so many people sort of over the age of 60 that and not enough young people paying taxes in and we and we've also you know we're rolling up the drawbridge and not letting as many immigrants into britain anymore so that tax base is shrinking and so demand on the nhs is just increasing inexorably as that tax base shrinks and no one has thus far been willing to reckon with the with this with this difficult problem and actually explain to the public well okay you've got the options of either we carry out a massive reform either we everyone just goes private and poor people no longer have access to health care or people pay a lot more in taxation and these these um reforms and ideas aren't always popular here because it's really hard to reform the nhs because of its place in the national psyche um but actually it's it's so urgent now it's so urgent you've got you know toddlers sleeping on floors in accident and emergency departments you've got pensioners waiting four days pensioners with suspected heart attacks you know waiting days for health care dying on trolleys you know people in car parks here receiving care in car parks because there's no capacity inside the actual hospitals themselves we just need to do something about it and, and reckon with the difficult truth Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. ¡Wow! Gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. 
Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en electrónicos, hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. At Parker, our purpose is simple. We want to make the world a better place. By working more efficiently. By using more sustainable practices. By developing better technologies. We keep moving forward. With each new idea, innovation, and partnership. We're one step closer to fulfilling our purpose every single day. To find out more, visit parker.com slash purpose. Parker, engineering your success. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Jack Rolla joining us on her tell. I, when we have these conversations, I always, I always put my hands up and I was like, okay, I'll have the universal healthcare versus whatever debate with anybody you want to. I want to tell everybody two things about me though. I lived overseas. I lived in Germany. I've been a German patient in the hospital. I've had a German ambulance pick me up. I know how that, the, that kind of model, the European model works intimately. I've been there. I'm also a VA health patient, veterans affair patient, which is the government run healthcare system in America. So I know the good, bad, and difference of all of this. If you live in Germany, you get excellent health care. But what we would call the middle class in America, you're also paying in the 40 percentile of taxes plus a 19 percent back tax to pay for all that. If you pitched America on 60 percent taxes, they would tar and feather you and run you out of town. You just mentioned it with the UK. There's no model of reform for the NHS that isn't involving raising taxes, but you've got a population problem at the same time. That's a math problem that has got to be solved if you're going to actually fix the NHS, right? And that brings in immigration. It brings in politics. It brings in the culture war stuff. That's an ugly ball to try to unwind. But the result of that is, is an NHS where it's really hurting people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And one, one thing people don't um, seem to often grasp about Britain is actually our healthcare system. It, it's not a straight European model. It's it is it's free at the point of use and it's it's uh, it's universal. So. I think in America, you often associate that with, with Europe, but actually it's quite different to how the rest of Europe works. We have, we don't have any real insurance model at all, whereas countries like Germany and the Netherlands, for example, they do, imp it's a much more heavily regulated insurance model than you have in America, but there is a sort of social insurance system there. And so we, in a sense, we have the worst of all worlds with our healthcare system because it's massive and bureaucratic and run by the state. And you have all the problems that go along with that, but also the quality of care and provision of care is really bad as well. So it's 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 a massive problem. And the dem the demographics that you you've just mentioned, I mean, that is the biggest thing now. And and actually it does it does go broader than the NHS. You mentioned immigration and the cultural stuff and everything. There there is a real there is a real generational divide here in the UK now. And actually part of improving public services. So the NHS, education, all those things. Part of that is making tough choices about, um, you know, letting more immigrants in and encouraging people to have more children um, and making policy more pro-family, because that's how you improve, increase the size of the tax base in the short and medium term. And that's how you fund good public services. And what's most interesting is that the, the very people who rely most on the National Health Service, the sort of over 60s, over 65s, those people are the most unwilling to confront those difficult choices and make Britain a more pro-family country and make Britain a more pro-immigrant country. And it's it's a cycle of despair. Yeah, Jack Rowlett, we have the same problem here with what we call the boomer generation, They, <laughs> but we'll get into that some other time. Let's talk about that right there, though, because this is where this starts to cross streams into some other areas of policy. That young cohort, let's just say 18 to 25, post-school, post-university, you know, that group, we're seeing some very troubling data post COVID coming out of the UK. They're having trouble getting jobs and they're tr getting, having trouble getting housing. 
You talked about the immigration problem. Look, it's an either or formula. You either have a high birth rate or you got to have immigrants if you're going to have an economy. You got to have one or the other. The people you do have can't get work and can't get housing to start their own lives and start their own. You know, housing is equity. Housing is wealth. These these are building blocks to your economy that we don't talk about as much as we do, like the unemployment rate. This is really troubling stuff for the UK, though, because the building blocks of the future economy for the next generation don't look real good right now. No, they, they look terrible. And if, and if I look at people my age who are looking to get on in life, you know, smart people my age, all of them are looking at leaving Britain because they don't think that there are opportunities here and they don't think the country is serious about improving things. Housing is a real barrier. Housing, the state of housing in the UK right now is a disaster on so many levels. You have the level that it's really hard to buy for first time buyers, the cost of housing relative to average wages is it's it's about nine and a half times higher the average house price compared to the average annual wage and in london it's something like 20 times higher it's it's ridiculous there and it, if you go back to the 1970s it was about three times the average annual wage so objectively in real terms the cost of housing has gotten so much more expensive over the past half century or so and then also that's now spilling over into the rental sector so for, for a long time, you've had a situation where younger people, you know, people in their 20s and 30s have struggled to afford housing, but there was plenty of rented accommodation that they could find and stay in. And that's not it's not desirable for people to be relying on that forever. But actually, at least you had somewhere you could go. Now we're in a situation where there's such a dire shortage of rented accommodation in lots of our cities particularly university cities we have students coming into cities and there's you know waiting lists for accommodation there's queues all the way around the block to look around apartments you have situations where landlords are, are actually renting apartments to the highest bidder as in the person who can pay the most rent per month rather than having a predetermined set amount and when you actually get into this accommodation a lot of it is really run down it's really bad it's damp it's moldy it's cold and so the, the, the quality of housing is really low. And because there's such a shortage, it means although we have laws around kind of minimum provisions that you have to have for accommodation in the UK, actually your power as a renter is minimal because you can go to your landlord and complain about something and the landlord's response will often be, well, OK, move out then. But you know you can't go anywhere else because there's nowhere else in your price range. You see your friends who are having to move back in with their parents because they can't even rent somewhere. Not that they can't even buy somewhere. They can't even rent somewhere. That's how bad it's gotten. And then that spills over into this intergenerational problem in that you have boomers here who own all the property, essentially, and they block new property from being built, particularly in the places we most need it. And so, again, that cycle of despair, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. That leads to less children being born. It leads to lower productivity. It leads to uh, lower tax take. And that makes public services worse and it makes Britain a less dynamic and versatile economy. Jack Rowland joining us. The reason I bring that up is because you said Britain is under a generational change. Generational change comes whether you want it to or not, right? There's no stopping it. It's the, that's the tide of time when it comes to people. Generational change can be good or it can be bad. We're looking at these economic problems. We're looking at the NHS problems. We're looking at the political upheaval in parliament right now in the UK. It doesn't look like this is going to be good generational change if you don't solve some of these problems. You have an or, a urban and rural problem. You know, the highest unemployment for the youth in, is in the West Midlands, the Birmingham, you know, the old industrial mm -hmm. sectors. It seems like there needs to be some pretty bold action here to cut off this whole generation going in a bad generational change instead of good generational change. But is there any movement to try to actually do anything about it? There's lots of grassroots campaigns, but at the top of politics, nothing is changing. I mean, our government has just made it harder, in effect, to build housing by abolishing housing targets um, that were placed on local authorities here, which means there's even less incentive for local councils here to build housing than there was before. And we already weren't building enough. Um, 
taxes here have been risen to the uh, the height they're now at the highest level they've been since the second world war and if you look at where the tax burden falls it's on working people and working young people and not on older people and so money is increasingly being given out to older people in the form of benefits from the state um and it's money from younger people that's funding that except that um the kind of dyna- the usual dynamics of history have been reversed. If you go back sort of 40 years, older people were tended to be in poverty at a much higher rate than the working age population. Now it's reversed. We have more than a third of pensioners here are millionaires. And the percentage of pensioners, retirees in poverty is considerably lower than the working age population now. And so things are being constantly rigged in their favor. We have um, here, uh, co- what we're dubbing the cost of living crisis now because the cost of energy is so high. And one of the things that the government's doing to help out with that is they're giving out payments direct to households, um, like a sort of amount taken off the bill of your energy. And yet, more money just goes to pensioners for that handout than anyone else. And it's not means tested at all, whether you're a rich pensioner or a poor pensioner. If you're old, you get a big handout from the state to help you with your energy. If you're a young person on a zero hours contract with a load of college debt who's struggling to pay their soaring rent, you get a lot less. And so the gov- and this, the problem for the government is their voter base is almost entirely the over 65s now. So there's no political impetus for them to make things better for younger working age people. Yeah, Jack Rowland, th- that's a universal problem. Every country has that problem. The older people are going to have more political power because they got more money, more assets, whatever. That's not new. However, you do have one advantage in England where you have a parliamentary system with outside some very specific judicial review. What parliament says goes, you know, you don't have a written constitution. So whatever parliament does, that goes. You could have some pretty sweeping change here if there was a political appetite for it. How much has the chaos of the last year or so really crippled people's belief in parliament? And I'm not just talking labor versus the Tories and that sort of stuff, just the chaos in general. That's where it really starts kind of hurting is because where you would look to parliaments like, OK, it's time to do some sweeping change here. And you're changing prime ministers every five minutes and you're just kind of sitting around waiting for the labor to get their turn. And you're probably not real super hyped that the labor's going to do a whole lot. That's a big problem of faith in government you've got when you really, really need them to be able to steady the ship. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the system's totally breaking down now. And if you look historically when one party gets tired, there's tended to be a politician from the other party who is a kind of radical, dynamic leader who people can get excited about and get behind. And actually, if you talk to people in the UK now, no one feels excited about about any of them. You know, they're, they're all terrible. They're all or not, or not terrible necessarily, but there's there's just a kind of apathy. Right. You either hate politics or you just feel apathetic towards it here. began and, and people look towards parliament and they look at we've had scandals um involving expenses we've had scandals involving drugs recently we've had scandals involving sexual harassment in westminster and people just look at them as sort of reflecting the worst of britain rather than the best of britain and so yeah i think people's faith in our politicians to actually get us out of this rut uh is very low right now yeah i had a labor friend uh quip to me like if all due respect to keir starmer he said, you know, if we had a labor leader worth anything, he'd be king instead of Charles after three, you know, conservative prime ministers having to resign in disgrace. Just, you know, it's stuff like that. Like nobody seems to be able to even capitalize on the other side, not being able to do anything. That's kind of I'm an outside observer. You tell me you're there. But when you can't take advantage of your political opponents, absolutely shooting themselves in the foot. I don't inspire a whole lot of confidence to me. I'm not picking a side. I'm just saying it looks bad. It looks chaotic. And it looks like even when this, you know, whenever you do have a general election this year, this fall, whenever that eventually happens, if Labor takes over, I don't really see anything really changing. Yeah, I mean, it, it should be stated that Labor are well ahead in the polls here at the moment. And Keir Starmer, for an opposition leader, is pretty popular. But there's that lack of enthusiasm. People are just kind of trundling along saying, oh, well, it's time for a change now. Conservatives have been really bad. Labour can't be any worse. There's there's no enthusiasm whatsoever. Um, but I think I think one interesting dynamic as well is that actually the last time Labour came into power, they did so on the back of a really strong economy. And so when they came in, there was lots of money to throw around on public services. There was lots of money to sort of improve things for um, lower earners, lots of money spent on tax credits, child benefit, all these sorts of things. 
when Labour inevitably, I think, win the next general election, whenever that is, and it has to be before January 2025, we're going to have just come out of a quite long and deep, uh, quite long um, and but relatively shallow recession on the back of a decade of really stagnant economic growth. And so there's, there's just not going to be money to change anything. I think we're looking at a wasted decade for Britain, really, now. In the 2010s, it was really cheap to borrow and we chose to cut capital uh, spending. We chose not to build more housing. We chose not to confront climate change. We chose not to confront our generational crisis and the pressure that that puts on public services. And now we're in the next decade, a decade of high inflation, of higher interest rates, of real downward pressure on growth. And we're, we're sort of left with very few options, but to sort of try and push forward and make things better in the 2030s. It really feels like there's not there's no real change that you could make really soon that would improve things because there's there's no money and there's so many structural problems in the UK now. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Main. Church and Main is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcasts at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Jack Rawlick joining us. That sounds bleak for uh, those of us. Look, we got our own best in America. I'm not going to pretend like we don't, especially with what's going on in Congress right now. And we're in a presidential election cycle for 2024 ourselves. So we'll, we will share some some guffaws if you want to send them our way, to be fair. What does and doesn't break through media, especially in or, uh, across the pond here? What's a few things for us, maybe the international audience, the American audience, or even the British audience, what should we be watching for beyond the headlines, beyond just PMQs, beyond just the nurses' strikes and the rail strikes? What's a couple of things we should be watching for as this year starts to unfold? Is it maybe having the, the election early? Is it maybe a new leader rising up through the ranks? What are you watching for that we should be watching in the headlines underneath all the noise? I think what's really interesting at the moment is, is Brexit, which has been out of the news for a couple of years now since we left the European Union. But what's really interesting now is people are turning against it here. We sort of have nearly 60% of the population saying that it was a mistake to leave the European Union and only around a quarter of the population saying that they think Brexit's going great. And we know from sort of trade figures that we're one of the only countries, uh, one of the only major economies where our levels of international trade haven't recovered from before the pandemic. And it's been long enough since we came out of COVID lockdowns now that we can sort of say that that, that might have something to do with Brexit. We've got problems at the borders. We've got problems in Northern Ireland. You know, the Northern Irish protocol still isn't sorted out. And I think for a, for a long time, the kind of Brexit wars was like an aspect of the culture wars and it was a real 50-50 split. Now it feels like people are decisively turning away from Brexit or certainly this hard 
detached view of Brexit and are actually more in favour of a closer relationship with Europe. And I think that will have an interesting effect on politics because the Conservatives have massively tied themselves to the, the strongest, hardest form of Brexit possible. But Labour have also kind of become a party of Brexit as well since the last general election. They of you know they're saying well we're not going to join the EU we just want to make Brexit work we don't want to get that much closer to Europe and so I think that's the interesting dynamic is what effect will that have on British politics as that stops being um, as the kind of the 50-50 divide between Remainers and Leavers here stops being a thing and instead people increasingly are re not necessarily wanting to rejoin the EU but are really dissatisfied with how Brexit has turned out. Yeah, Jack Harlow joining us. Let's be adults here, though. That sentiment and undoing Brexit after the decade of getting to Brexit, that's two very different things. And plus, that's not up to just the UK anymore. We saw what the EU did since Britain and the UK has left. They're not exactly going to give wrap a basket full of provisions for you to come back either. That could be even worse of a situation. There's a lot of mess there if they ever decide to try to go back down that hallway again. I wonder how much taste there would be for that if they actually tried to do it. Yeah, I think that that's that's one of the big barriers is that I, I mean, if I were the EU, I wouldn't really want us back at this point. And and I don't I don't think there's much suggestion that we'd go in to Europe. Well, they again, want you but... back, but they're going to want you on your knees crawling back. Yeah, well... And economically, everything's going to be seventy thirty their way, which I'm not sure that really fixes anything for the UK. I'm just being real about it. Like, mm. if I was them, I'd do it too. It's like, sure, we'll have you back, but everything's going to be in our favor this time. Yeah, and they'd want us to join the Euro and and possibly Schengen as well. So it would be we would lose a lot of the advantages we had last time we remembered the EU. But what I think could happen is there could be a move towards sort of a, a form of associate membership. So joining, trying to join the single market. So rather than going back into the EU, just having a closer relationship with Europe's institutions. Again, the terms that Europe might demand from us if we try to do that might be too high a price to pay. But I think there is an increasing sort of understanding in Britain that maybe Brexit, either Brexit was a mistake or we've just messed Brexit up really badly. I think that's increasingly becoming the consensus here. Yeah, interesting times we live in my friend for our friends across the pond, Jack Rowlett, one of our great Young Voices contributors. He's a writer and commentary. He's all over the place. Great talking to you. Before we get you back again, let folks know where they can keep up with you, what you got going on, and how they can follow you until we talk to you again on Her Tell, my friend. So you can find me on Twitter at Jack underscore Nostalgic, and you can find all my articles there, all my latest writing, latest appearances on British television and radio as well, and keep up to date with my thoughts on British and global politics. Yep, there's a lot of stuff on housing, which is really important stuff to pay attention to because I know we all got sick of infrastructure, but that's the infrastructure stuff that matters. Pay attention to it. Jack Rowlett, thank you so much for the time, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ah, welcome back to Her Tell. She hadn't been here for a while. She's been very, very busy, but we're glad we got her down to start the new year off here on Herd Tell. Alice Watson Brown, one of our favorites, Young Voices contributor, University of Bristol graduate. How are you, my friend? I am very well, Andrew. I'm so happy to be back on the show. Uh, it has been too long, and I'm excited just for a, a good, light conversation about you know what's most important and going on in the world. Yeah, because there's nothing major going on there. Or no, here, or it's kind of boring. <laughs> Hardly. I actually want to start right there because we talk to our UK friends all the time. It's been a tumultuous year in the UK. Politics, different prime ministers, the cost of living crisis that doesn't look like it's it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. I think that's a fair way to put it. You're going to have some sometime in the next year, year and a half, you're going to have another election. So who knows how that goes. But here's how I want to ask this, because there's no way. Let's even back up a couple of years to the Brexit stuff. Your generational cohort, that, that 20 to 30 year old group, the, the part that just went through college, they graduated school about the time Brexit happened. Now they're coming out of college in the middle of this cost of living crisis. There's no way that's having not having a cultural and political shift on your generation, is there? Absolutely not. As a young person, so I, I'm 22. Uh, I graduated a few months ago. Um, so I was 16 when Brexit happened and then that was sort of my formative political experience I guess and um, I didn't really 
I would kind of just remember 2010 with the coalition and how that was shock horror. And then it was just sort of when I came to my political maturity, it just seemed to be, you know, a historical event after historical event. Um, and now having gone through Brexit and COVID uh, and the impact that COVID especially has had on the economy, um, I would say that, that the economy is our biggest concern with young people. Um, and culturally, that means none of us are moving out. None of us can afford to really buy a house in the short term, um, even though interest rates are quite stable. Um, the prices, they're just too high. Um, so it's not fun at the moment, unless you're a very lucky person and you do manage to fall onto that dream grad job um, and get your sort of 60K a year, you're balling, you're doing great. Um, but I guess, and we look back, I look back on my education uh, as a sort of the class of COVID. Um, I wasn't sort of in the midst of it, but I lost 18 months of, of university. And I think, what was it all for? I went through schooling, I, I abided to their standardized testing um, in a very competitive atmosphere. I was lucky enough to, I went to one of the top schools in the country, a boarding school and then a pretty, you know, respectable university. I was a very, I had a very lucky educational upbringing. And where am I at the moment? Um, without sounding too existential, I have no prospect of moving out. Um, I'm struggling to get a job. My elder siblings haven't yet moved out. Um, and pretty much everyone I know is in the same situation. And the government is not doing anything to help us apart from just, you know, their main focus is the NHS. They can't pin their workers down. They can't pin rail strikes. They, yeah, they we're just being thrusted by all these things. That means we are being swept under the net. Aside from the fact that we are expected to be caught up in these culture wars and be on either side of something the whole time. One side of an argument, we're either woke or anti-woke left or right um pro-trans anti-trans all of that it's sort of i don't want to complain too much but it is kind of exhausting um <laughs> and but yeah i think at the moment my main worry and you know the conversations you have with your friends when you go to the pub uh after a day of day of work or not work or whatever that's all you talk about is how cool you are and how much you want to move out and as much as we love our parents we're old we're too we're too old to be living with them um and it doesn't feel like there's any going to be any future respite for that, apart from just keeping on going. Yeah, Alice Watson Brown joining us. That's the part I'm driving at because I can go back. I'm a little bit older than you, not much. <laughs> um, I can go back. We can look at like you know the recession of the 2008 to 2009s. We can go mm -hmm. back to the late 90s. There's political change when there's economic turmoil, especially to young folks, because it hits them differently. I noticed in my own children, my younger children that were in high school, primary school for y'all, you know, those later grades, it really changed how they saw education. They didn't see school as something they go and do anymore. They really saw it as a government institution because it got shut down, took away from them for 15 months, or at least my kids did. It completely changed how they saw education. They see school as a government entity now. That's going to change how they see the rest of their lives. So for your cohort, COVID is unique because it's not just you. It's so many people. That's going to change how you see government. It's going to change how you see politics. It sees how you change how you see economics. The folks that are arguing the political stuff in the UK, I really wonder how much it's hitting the next generation. Because in 10 years, when y'all are the dominant force, you're going to cross a lot of those old traditional lines. The old playbook isn't really going to fit you all that well, is it? No, I, I agree. And I think it, it's good to hear that, you know, from your own children that they saw it as a, a government institution. It, it was as much of a chore as paying taxes, if that makes sense. And I can't remember who wrote it. I think it was Joseph Piper. He said that in, you know, not verbatim, but education and leisure are, are one. I think the origin of the word school, you know, there, there was creativity and fun in that original meaning of the word. And there isn't anymore. It's and there wasn't. It was just kind of like, oh, yeah, we, you know, you're allowed to be here now. So you better do really well. And we we're going to examine you in the exact same way before, you know, you had your classrooms taken away from you and you had your in-person time taken away from you. And you can't complain. What are you on about? Um, and you're still going to be expected to adhere to the same standards as always people before you. Um, and that is just quite hard to come to grips with because you always have a certain sense of trust to those people who mentor you 
academically and those who teach you. I always did. Um, and that was sort of taken away. I didn't end up really respecting the people, the institutions all that much, which is bad. I don't want to feel like that, but it's true. Um, yeah. That quote makes me think of the Robin Williams quote where he's explained politics. He said, poly from the Latin word for many and ticks, meaning blood sucking parasite. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you're coming out of, you know, the education, whether it's there or America, one thing, you know, education up through college, it's a system. It's a conveyor belt. You're expected, OK, go through all these steps. You mentioned it earlier. Like, look, we did all that. I heard this from my own child. You, I did everything right. I did all the steps they told me to do. They didn't hold up their end. Mm. Like it, that really is like a primal thing that changes. That's also a dangerous thing because now you're you're not talking about a policy change. You're talking about people that have built-in resentment now and i don't think you're just going to be able to policy change that away no it's it's creating a general consensus of revolutionary politics i suppose rather than reactionary and that about what can we conserve that was good for us for our children than us just feeling like we need to tip this over and just start again because it's just useless um and whilst i do kind of think that in the uk especially our way of examining people and this was before covid to be fair uh, our, our examination systems, I think, was flawed um, hugely. Um, but these people, even if they did everything right, as you say, they followed their steps. And some of them, poor people, weren't even allowed to take the exams that they were promised to show what people what they could do. They just said, oh, no, we, like people are too ill. You can't show up to take your test, which will actually define where you go to college, where you go for the rest of your life, what you can study. Um, and that that's awful. That is one entire trench of influence of your life just taken away from you and that is completely out of your control and that's not fair and especially was the reason why i wanted to bring up the um essay bot the sort of ai um you know it's that if this whole thing comes in the context that literacy rates in the uk and the us are shocking at the moment i think it's something like uh in the uk i think three quarters of white boys fail to meet the literary standards in the UK. And I think something in the US, it's like uh, around 54% of adults fall below sixth grade literacy rates, which is A, costly to the economy, and B, what are we doing to our children? Why are we not worrying about this and instead letting them watch porn the entire time um, and making them think that that's real? Why, why are we not encouraging them to write stories to play with Lego, to build things, to and why are we bothered about how they identify about their outward expression rather than their inward monologue with themselves and how they how they teach themselves how to make mistakes gracefully or however Jordan Peterson puts it. But it's to me so wrong. And now there's this whole thing where you don't even need to work to write your essays. It's this um, new story I think that came out. It's this bot called Chat GPT. Um, and it can write pretty coherent mid-grade essays for you um, for free. You don't even need to pay for it. And I think the Daily Telegraph, actually, they paid a teacher to mark an essay written by this bot. And they said, you know, it wasn't sophisticated, but it was very coherent. And uh, this tech is only going to get more advanced. And uh, whilst I'm not against, you know, ed tech, it's a huge market in the UK, as I'm sure it is in the US, and how it helps, you know, people all across the world get a better education with more resources. Um, this is, why aren't people concerned about this? Alongside all these other trends, and I think it has been lost, it has been suffocated uh, alongside all the other parts of the culture war. But this is gonna be our greatest casualty and we're not gonna notice it for a long time. But when we do, we'll have no one but ourselves to blame. Yeah, Alice Watson Brown joining us. It links to that literacy thing you just said because we've got the data on the COVID stuff in the US. I don't know about the UK numbers. In the US, the thing that got hurt the most was math and reading. Some mm -hmm. of these kids are two years behind on reading now, and we have further data 
Uh, we covered it on the show a couple of weeks ago. Early literacy programs are the one thing that, yeah, they're expensive. Yes, we sink a lot of money into them, but it's also one of the few things that we actually got data that it works really well. Early mm. literacy, that's one of the things that carries through. The problem with this is in the U.S. education system is we've lost literacy, not because we don't teach reading, but the entire of the education system is built towards standardized testing. We're teaching kids how to take a test instead of teaching kids how to learn and it kills their literacy. So the reason that literacy piece and that bot piece you're just talking about where the look, the bot, that technology has a lot of good to it. People with mm. disabilities, people working in second and third languages, people um, trying to get, you know, you think of people that are nonverbal that could maybe yeah. use that and open their world up. That has a lot of good things. But when you start tempting something like that to people who have not been correctly educated and they know they've got to pass these ed essays and these tests, that's a bad combination and it's just rife for abuse and and it and it's just going to further hurt the education system it's going to hurt the education system and the pupils who they claim to serve um and what do we have to do with that these people are going to hopefully be leading this country but our countries the world um and you know people do you really want to care you said oh yeah i didn't actually write any of my essays when it comes to these the, the learning how to write and the learning how to read this should be a common currency across the world and we're losing that that was the main thing how we measured you know women's rights and women's education was how many people can read and how many people can write and how many people can do maths where is that where's that gone but yeah and and going back to the sort of post-covid um factor about literacy rates being behind there are pockets of students in the uk who just haven't returned to school they don't they're, they're missing um i don't have the exact figures and i don't want to chuck one out of thin air but it's it's concerning um and that has cropped up in mainly kind of right-leaning uh, media outlets um over the last few months but i don't know if it's the same in the us but this is worrying and these children are from vulnerable households from abusive parents um you know low income mainly uh in the uk it's mainly concentrated in the northern regions um and some left-wing papers have blamed that on brexit which i find nonsensical i couldn't really see a coherent link between their arguments um but it's no coincidence that if you don't tell kids to come to school they won't do it made to just write essays like a machine and not yeah. actually getting any feedback that's universal kids don't want to go to school unless you make them alice watson brown joining us it's the same here look the stats were bad when you start talking about disparaging people groups minorities uh, lower income, lower income, you go, the stats get worse. I mean, mm. it's just an arguably, those are the people that got left behind because the people with means found way, you know, they could get tutors, they could link up. I, I know in my home state of West Virginia, they had to put Wi-Fi rigs and buses and run them up and down the hollers and park them at a Walmart. And then everybody would go to the Walmart to the bus to get on Wi-Fi because there's not enough broadband. You know, you start talking about issues like that. We talk about education, especially in America. I don't know how it is in England. Basically, like if we just write enough money and we make the system big enough, it's going to fix itself. And we know that's not the truth because of the things you're just saying. And I come at, when I worked in the corporate world, it was starting to get like this. And now it's really getting like this. We have all these college degreed people, but they're having trouble getting jobs because everybody's got a college degree now that are the same. And they don't have a real skill set that sets them apart anymore. And I, I worry that what's just happened in the UK, you're going to start having that same problem there with the way the testing and the, the way y'all do the test outs or whatever you call them. I forget the term. The way y'all do that now, when you do that COVID scrunch of putting everybody together, you're going to have the same problem. All those people are in the same bucket fighting for a, a lesser and lesser jobs that are out there. This is a real problem, and it's a call to reevaluate how we're doing education, but we're not looking at it that way. We're just looking at it as a political problem. I agree, and it shouldn't be politicized. And I think when you were saying, um, mentioning hard, like skills, like hard skills, I also I don't think that we're being taught hard skills in school. We're not being taught. I think what's valuable now is being taught how to set up a dropshipping business so you can make money alongside, you know, uni or so you can fund your studies or you can fund a you know a three-week course in how to code python that's going to make you instantly more employable um how can i fund you know my own shop on shopify so i can at least learn how to sell i can learn how to talk to people and i can learn how to sell and i can learn how to negotiate um and i can learn how to walk back with more money in my pocket though those are the kind of things that i think some people are encouraging um you know that like self-reliance and entrepreneurship 
I think that's really important. But the fact that it's our only option now, really, to make ourselves feel fulfilled is sad. Um, yeah, I think there are now a lot of courses online that are teaching you how to, you know, how you can become a dropshipping master or a forex trader in two weeks and things like that. There are more and more scams online, of course, you know, these sort of get rich quick at home. Um, but a lot of people are doing that. A lot of my friends, you know, are, are nomads now um, and they're enjoying it. Don't get me wrong. But these are people who you, from the schools they went to and the grades they got, you would expect would be flying high without any effort. Yeah, Alice Watson Brown joining us. That's something I wonder about too. Is you just mentioned it? Normally, you know, the folks that go to the better schools and do the certain career paths, they're expected to go into high finance, big business, mm -hmm. politics, civil service, whatever. Is there going to be a brain drain in the UK from this? Because I think in the COVID area in America, with the way the government's going and some of those things, I think we're seeing a bit of a brain drain in government and politics because a lot of the quote unquote good people don't want to fool with the mess. And that's always kind of been a joke, but I think we got some data to back it up now. Is that a fear in the UK with all the chaos? And now, like you just said, they're having these nomad things. They may go find something that they really like to do. That is not that traditional career path. That's going to be a brain drain on not only government and civil service over there, but the country as a whole. I agree. I think, um, I think you sort of touched on the phrase, it's like the best people don't go into politics. I don't know who said that, but it's something that's, you know, I, I say to a lot of people, um, I, there was there is no viable alternative, really. There's no viable political future for the UK. Uh, even when, you know, Boris Johnson was going out of office, we were like, oh, let's just come along. But there was no kind of one person we were like, you know, we're, we're it's, it's three nil down and we've got two minutes to go. We're going to get him in or her in. There was no one person who we would... He, he was the forerunner of this um and a lot of people say to me like oh you why why not why aren't you going to politics like the, obviously you, you'd love to go and i was like i i'm 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 you know i'm just as bad as a lot of other people who just say i don't want to touch that i don't want to do it because a you don't i don't know how much change you would make and b i can't be bothered for the optics the the hate that's going to come just for trying um the, the sort of the echo chamber that you have to engage with now of social media if you want to put your name out there and that I guess that comes with the job but I don't know it's um I hope it's not right but when you were talking about the civil service in the UK interestingly um because we've now realized that we are, have such a bloated bureaucracy uh we're just creating jobs and throwing money at it like you said about the US education system hoping it would solve things. Um, people have now caught on that that isn't the way and they're slashing positions in the civil service at the moment. Um, but that's not the way with other state institutions like the NHS. Interestingly, a lot of my friends who have landed graduate jobs are in the health service management schemes, not in the civil service, not in GCHQ um, or any other kind of like traditional sort of high flying occupation. Alice Watson Brown joining us. It's a little different in the UK than here, but there there's a common theme I'm hearing and I see it in your part. Look, I watch PMQs just about every Wednesday. I'm, I'm pretty up on the UK politics, but I see a common theme there that's here. There just seems to be a lot of frustration without any outlet for it. And I don't want to get, you know, doomsaying about it, but the UK has got some real issues and we've got some real issues here. We've got a couple of years, the next two years, and then this, this next election cycle in the U.S. This is going to be very contentious because we've got a divided Congress. We've got a presidential election coming. This is going to be some ugly stuff for a while. The UK looks like they're usually you have these pretty stable premierships where you get three, four, five, six year runs. That's not going to happen. It doesn't look like Sunak's going to get too far into next year without having to have some kind of an election. That'll be four in about 18 months, give or take. Let's just ballpark it. That's not normal instability for the UK. How does that land with the people though? They've got, I know at the end of the Brexit, it was just, okay, it's over. We almost don't even care which way, just make mm -hmm. it go away, right? 
is it getting to be that way with parliament and the premiership right now? Because it seems like it feels like from the outside, folks are just kind of sick of this rut that the parliament and the prime minister and the revolving door are in right now. I think so. It, it, it's, it's a, it's a rut of epic proportions. Um, I would say, uh, I think the trail of leadership since Boris Johnson. So you had Liz Truss who tried to be radical, but the one rule about being radical is that you have to be reassuring in order to succeed. And she wasn't reassuring. Uh, it was a bulldozing, blundering, you know, trying to be Margaret Thatcher kind of performance caricature, which failed, obviously. And then you have Rishi Sunak. He's quieter, more reassuring, but fluffy, no personality, sort of disliked by a lot of the conservative grassroots because of his role in COVID and lockdown. Um, in essence, the Conservative Party now has fallen into the trap of its Labour counterpart and that it doesn't know what it stands for. I spoke about the Labour problem, I think, in the last podcast, but um, I think their, their main identity crisis now is over taxation. Are you a party of high taxation or low tax? It's not a, it's not a difficult question to answer. And because they created the mess in which they had to raise taxes, they are now at an utter loss at which string to grasp to pull themselves forwards. It, it it's fascinating to watch, albeit depressing. Um, it's fascinating. And uh, there's now sort of on the edge, or is there's the tension of, is Nigel Farage going to return to politics? Is he going to make this grand re-entry for, you know, leave the GB News studio and come in and save everyone? Um, a lot of Tory MPs are scared they'll lose their seats if he does. Um, but I, I have no faith in that really ensuing anything different either. It'll just be new crisis, different day. Yeah, I'm, I don't know that gasoline on the fire is what's called for here. I don't know if that's a British <laughs> saying or not, but it certainly is where I am. That will be one hot mess. But unfortunately, here's the problem. And, and again, we're not even talking specific politics here. We're just talking big picture here. People get sick of it. People have bandwidth. People can only take so much, even with parties they agree with and ideologies they agree with. That's when you really have trouble, though, is when people start tuning out and they just start going, just make it stop and go away. That's when the really bad, ugly stuff happens. And that's why we need to be vigilant both in the UK with whatever happens in your next election and us with what's going to be happening here. That's when you really got to be vigilant because when people are going, no, 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 just make it stop. That's when the untoward actors start really working their stuff and be like, oh, I'll make it all better. Listen to me. This is the time we got to really hold on to our principles and pay attention to what's going on even more so as hard as it is. I agree. That's the time when accountability goes out the window and populism becomes your best friend. Uh, it's, as you say, pouring fuel on fire. Um, I have no idea what really will ensue in the next general election in the UK. Uh, I imagine the Conservatives will lose their majority. Um, whether that means they are not going to be the largest party is a different question. Uh, I have a feeling they will remain the largest party because Labour have not yet made a stand that has made them attractive to conservative voters who can cross enemy lines in my opinion um but i don't know the problem is also is that i think in the U i was reading us news today as well that as well the politicians seem to be fighting between themselves more than their more than the public and that seems to me wrong uh it, it should be the other way around um, I think it wasn't it. So the Republicans are taking back the House and now they want to launch an inquiry on Joe Biden and COVID uh, about Hunter Biden's laptop. And you think obviously these are, you know, these could be pretty big wedge issues. But it seems to me that rather than as soon as the other side gets in, rather than building and carving their own future for that, you know, for their beliefs, they're just trying to make it look like the guy before them did a worse job than they're going to do. What kind of a system is that? It's it's not appealing. It's not attractive, and it's discouraging any you know attractive talent from joining you. Um, and it's you know it, it's not durable. No, and they better Alice Watson Brown join us. They better do some. I've been writing about this, and it, even really hardcore folks on the right that really understand it are like, no, you better do some governing because remember our Congress. You're up every two years. We could have this really absurd thing where we flip the Senate and the Congress both right mm. back again in two years. Be interesting to watch. Alice Watson Brown. I love talking these bigger picture cultural stuff because it's important because, 
you know, this is the stuff that, you know, like we're talking about the, the generational cohorts. And this is stuff in 10 years. People are going to be like, oh, how did this get this way? And we can go back and go like, look, we were already talking about it. So it's good to talk to you about these things. Uh, we always enjoy having you back on the program. We will have you back on the program in 2023. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. That's another American <laughs> saying. We don't know. Y'all need to adopt that one, too. Probably. Um, <laughs> Uh, let folks know where they can follow you and keep up with you. Um, you can even pitch your Spotify account if you want to. I know you're all into the fashion stuff. But let folks know where they can keep up with you till we get you back on Hertel again. Yeah, so my Twitter handle is just at Alice Watson Brown. Uh, no, A L Y S Watson Brown. Uh, I will be posting more there occasionally now. I have been radio silent, probably because I'm losing faith, which is bad. So we're going to keep our principles and we're going to keep investing. <laughs> But thank yep. you so much for having me on. It's been such a pleasure, and I really hope to see you soon. I do, too. That's why we do Twitter Supper Club, though. Put the food on there. Let's yes. get our faith and humanity back in there. <laughs> Alice Watson-Brown, you're great, my friend. Talk to you soon. Thank you for the time. Thank you, and you, too. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Maine. Church and Maine is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcasts at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.